such a low state of spiritual power in the church today. Because the church has forsaken the altar. We can have great programs. We can have great singing. We can have great teaching. We can have great talent. We can have great preaching. Great worshiping. But if you as an individual and our church does not have an altar, the church will falter. It will be unsteady. It will be unsure. And it will be weak. It will stumble. And ultimately it will lose faith and abandon the cause. God said, my house shall be called of all nations a house of prayer. Not a house of dramas, not a house of plays, not a house of great preaching, not a house of great fellowship and dinners, not a house of great singers and musicians, but a house of prayer. We can have all of this up here together, but if us as a church forsake the altars, we'll falter. We know the physical health of a person by their temperature. We know the spiritual health of a person or a church by its spiritual temperature. And you know the spiritual temperature by their commitment to prayer. No prayer, no power. Look to somebody beside you and say, no prayer, no power. Little prayer, little power. Much prayer, much power. When I was growing up, one of the greatest ministries in the church were the altar workers. There were people who had an altar in their own lives. And they knew what God could do in hearts and lives at the altar. If we want to have real, old-fashioned revival, then we've got to get the old altar workers back to work again. We've got to have people in our church that refuse to sit back and watch while others pray. But something inside of you says, I can't let anybody go to the altar alone. I need to get up there with them. The altar's got to be filled. we got to have some people that say, if the altars are no good, we got to fill them up. Take something to the altar. I remember they would come along beside you and labor with you in prayer until you broke through. Didn't matter how long they were up there. I recall many nights that this church service just went on and on, lingered and lingered, and they would not dare dismiss while people were praying. And there was no fidgeting, there was no squirming, there was no looking at what time it was. But everybody's interest in the church was what was going on at the altar. Amen. We've got to get more interested in what is taking place at the altar in our lives, at the altar in our church, than anything else. Less interest on fellowship, less interest on what's going to happen after church, and more about what's going on right here and right now. Just what Brother Kevin preached. It doesn't matter what happened 15 minutes ago. It matters what's taking place right here and right now. They would pray for you if you needed a healing. They would pray until the healing took place. I remember being asked over and over and over, is that pain gone? Is that pain gone yet? Is it gone yet? And every time I said no, they'd start praying again. And we would pray until we broke through. We'd pray until we saw a miracle. If somebody needed deliverance, we'd pray until they were delivered. And we'd keep praying and keep praying as long as they were willing to labor, as long as they were willing to pray and press through. How dare we sit down and give up on somebody that is on the verge of a breakthrough? And then we prayed until they got the Holy Ghost. We prayed until it was overflowing. We wouldn't settle with them just speaking a little bit of ten times. We prayed until it was overflowing. We prayed until they had the joy of the Holy Ghost. We prayed until they had peace. We prayed until they had satisfaction. We prayed until they take off dancing across the church. And then we wanted to see something happen. And we refused to settle for anything less than what God had in store for us. The most beautiful sound I have ever heard in a church is not the sound of great preachers preaching. Not even the sound of great singers singing. But it's the sound of the church in prayer. And there's something so beautiful about walking into somebody's prayer when they've been in travail. 
when they have been birthing, having birthing pains, pushing something forth in their prayer, something spiritual is about to be born, and you can just feel that something's getting ready to happen. Amen. We need some people that will pray until something happens. We need some intercessor prayer warriors. Where are they today? There's something beautiful about the church on her knees in her weakness. The church is clothed in majesty and strength and power. When the church, as Elijah, bows her head and begins to pray and travail, something happens in the spirit realm. Hell goes on high alert. Demons go to shaking and chains start breaking. Yokes are destroyed. Captives are delivered and set free. And sons and daughters are birthed into the kingdom of God. Everything that Satan has ever done to the church or against the church has one prime objective. Get them off their knees. Keep them off their knees. Keep them out of what we used to call the prayer closet. Keep them out of the prayer rooms. Keep them from coming to pre-service prayer. Keep them from praying too long afterwards. Let's, let's apprehend their minds. Let's capture their attention. Anything but prayer. I don't care if they shout. I don't care if they dance a little. As long as they don't get in the spirit. As long as they don't pray. As long as it's not coupled with fiery, hot, fervent prayer. The devil doesn't care. He doesn't care that you showed up today if you came just just to show up, if you came just to shake hands, if you came just to sing some songs, if you came thinking that worship alone was going to do it, I've come to tell you, the devil doesn't mind, but when you come in prayer, when you've been praying from the moment you woke up, and you prayed as you was walking through the doors, and you've been in prayer while service has been going on, if you've been in prayer during that duration, I'm telling you, you are connected with heaven right now, and Satan can't stand it. No, he can't. Anymore, we have some of the church that are feeling after God and are sensitive to the Spirit, and we have others that don't know what's going on. Anymore, we have the sinners, people that don't know anything about God, coming to the altars and praying and seeking God and, and, and some even for the first time while a seasoned saint sit back and watch shouldn't happen in God's house of prayer. But where there is a soul, there ought to be a hunger inside of you that says I need to pray for them. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. I'm going to push. I'm going to cause something. That we're going to shake heaven. Amen. We're going to terrify hell. The devil knows, amen, that, that, that the church on her knees is going to plunder hell. Amen. The greatest gift that God can give to us is not big churches. It's not not better preachers. It's not more money or nicer houses or fancier cars. The greatest gift that God can give to the church is a spirit of prayer. The greatest gift that God can give you is a spirit of prayer. How come you grow more during adversity? How come you grow more during a season of pain and turmoil and tragedy? Because that's when you finally wake up and pray. And then all of a sudden we're praying again. And then what happens? We feel God come near. I want you to know that we can feel Him near anytime we want. If we'll utilize the power of prayer. Don't wait till you're in your next battle. Don't wait till you're in the next valley. Don't wait till you're facing the next storm. I'm calling on you right now, the church of God, to pray now. Don't wait. Do you think he's coming? Don't wait until somebody has shook you to the core. Don't wait until they've sung the right song. Don't wait until you lost someone. Don't wait until your heart is broken. Don't wait till something has gone wrong and gone bad in your life. Pray now. Pray in the pray if it's a good day. Pray if it's a bad day. Pray if it's an okay day. Just pray because God woke you up. Pray because there's breath inside of your body. Pray because this is the day that the Lord has 
made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Pray, because it's our way of communicating with God. And if we're not praying, we're not talking to Him. And rest assured, if you're not talking to Him, Glory. Don't come to me with a word from God if you haven't been talking to Him. Because God's not just going to keep talking to you and giving you insight and using you in the gifts of the Spirit if you're not communicating with Him. I can preach because I pray. Not because I'm perfect, because I'm not. And somebody say, but man, don't... Adam, I, I can't, I can't go fulfill my ministry because I, I, I just have so many flaws and so many things and, and so many things going wrong and and, and, and I'm thinking, man, don't it, it, do you have a prayer life? Because you will grow and you'll get stronger and you'll you'll fall less and, and and you'll stay down for shorter lengths of time and it'll get better. But if you don't pray, it will get worse. If you don't pray, it's never going to happen for you. Don't worry about getting good and getting perfect with God right now. Just learn how to pray to Him and all these other things that happen. If you learn how to pray, you'll get good with God. So many didn't understand how David could all of a sudden warrior up, face the giant. And how after facing the giant, he, he I mean the only the only time he used a sword was when he cut the giant's head off. But the giant had already been laid out and, and, and we knew it was a supernatural surely they had to know that was a supernatural thing. I mean who <laughs> comes out here with a slingshot? But then from that point forward, he, he, uh, before long, he's stepping into kingship and, 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 and he's got to put on some armor and he's got to pick up a sword and he's got some battles to fight. And, and, and surely there were some men thinking, man, well, where, uh, where did he learn how to use a sword? How can we trust him? How can we follow him? He was a shepherd on the hillside. But don't forget that while he was hurting sheep, while he was out there watching and guarding sheep, he was also fighting a fight and he was talking to God. He was worshiping and he was praying. You see, it wasn't that David was good with the sword. It was that David was good with the Lord. And if you get good with the Lord, you'll get good at everything else. I didn't know how to preach until I got good with God. I didn't really know how to worship or get into church until I got good with God. And now I just got to worship. And now I just love Him so much that I can't sit still. But I had to get good at communicating with Him. I can't have a message. If I'm not talking with God, I can't have a relationship if I'm not talking with God. How many of y'all feel like you, you want to grow in God? And now you know you got to talk to Him. How many feel like you're, that, that, that you could get closer, that you have, you have room to grow? That's all of us. Then church. Let's pray like never before and let's see revival. Let's see something happen. God wants to do something. You know, this message was not what I planned to preach today at all. This is something that was quickened to me quickly. Amen. I had a few notes set aside, but not what I was going to preach. But I feel God pushing and pressing in my spirit that we've got to get radical in our prayer lives. We've got to, we're excited in so many other things and excited about so many other things. But where are the prayer warriors? Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. When we learn how to pray and tap in and push in, all of a sudden, the bad news that we've been hearing will be wrong. Look to the person beside you and tell them the good news is the bad news is wrong. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'm going to say that again. The good news is the bad news is wrong. Will anybody in this place rise up and pray with me right now? Yes, Lord. I wonder if, we, if, if, if somebody could kneel down at the altar, if we could feel this. This altar, I know we don't have a lot of room. That's going to do something right here, right now. As we're praying, I, I want to tell somebody that everything is not as it appears. Sister Sandra, everything is not as it appears. I came to tell somebody who has been overwhelmed by their circumstances. There is more to this than meets the eye. I've got 
to get somebody to shift out of the natural and into the supernatural. You know how that happens? It happens through prayer. I've got to get you out of the visible and into the invisible. Out of the realm of the senses and into the realm of faith. Right now we've got to go there. You see, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Joshua and Caleb's report was a good report because it was a faith report. The other ten spies brought back what the Bible calls an evil report. Why was it an evil report? Because it contradicted the word of God. How many of you have been told you're going to live and not die? How many have been told God's going to make a way? How many have been told the miracle's on its way? How many of you have been told don't stop dreaming, don't let go of that dream, don't let go of that prophecy, don't let it go? <laughs> then rebuke that evil report because it contradicts the word of God. Whoever you are that have been listening to an evil report, You've been listening to what your circumstances are saying. You've been listening to what your feelings are saying and what your enemies are saying and what your friends are saying. Isaiah asked the question, whose report will you believe? David was tending his father's flock. And one day a lion simply appeared and stole a lamb from the fold. And most people would have said, you'll never see that lamb again. Most people would have just written it off as one of life's casualties and said, the devil got that one. Most people would have said, I, I better just stay here and protect what I got left. And, and that is what the lion was counting on. The lion never counted on someone like David. I wonder if somebody in their spirit would cry out right now, devil, you never counted on someone like me. You never counted on someone like me. You don't know who you're fighting. You don't know who you're facing. David wasn't like most people. He took it personal and he took it hard. It angered him that a lion would break into his fold and, and invade the safety of his fold and steal from him. No doubt this devil had invaded many flocks before. Tore up marriages. And I rebuke the devil that would try to destroy marriages. And I rebuke the devil that would try to tear up ministries. I rebuke the devil that would try to kill dreams and steal hope and joy and peace from many homes. No doubt this devil had carried sons and daughters off into drug addiction, off into perversions. This was not the first flock he had invaded. It was not the first lamb he had stolen. And time after time, he had left behind him a broken man. I feel like there's some broken people here today. You've been crying, you've been emotional, and you don't even know why. And it angers you that you've even been so emotional and so hurt. And a spirit of depression has come upon you. And you're living in a broken home. You've got broken children. And from all natural appearances, the devil has succeeded again. But you ought to look deep down inside of you and tell yourself, it ain't that way. This time it's going to be different. Instead of David sitting down and crying and saying, why me? Why'd this have to happen to me? David refused to just write off his losses and settle for leftovers. I'm going to stop right here and tell some of you. Some of you right here are settling for leftovers. Just happy to have something left over. Just thankful that the devil didn't take it all. Just satisfied to still be in your right mind. Satisfied to just have enough money to make ends meet. But I just believe I'm talking to somebody that is sick and tired of leftovers. Brother Kevin, you don't have to live in lack. you 
God is far more invested into what's right here. And if you get this right, the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. You get this right, and everything else is going to get right. God's going to do it. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray, Lord, that he be able to turn his life over you completely. I release you right now from, from anything the devil would use to hold you back. I rebuke the enemy right now in the name of Jesus. I command it in Jesus' name. I don't, I don't know what this means. I, I don't know a whole lot about you, but God told me rebuke the drug dealer in the name of Jesus Christ. To rebuke him in Jesus' name. I don't know what that means. I'm not saying that you're a drug dealer. I'm not saying you use drug. But I just got to obey God. And God told me to speak that out loud. To rebuke the drug dealer in Jesus' name. God set you free. I loosen you in the name of Jesus. I loosen you in Jesus' name. They push it, they push it, they push it, they put it in your face, and, and you try to hold it off for so long, but you end up caving in, you end up caving in, but God's giving you strength right now, he's going to give you strength, I don't know how many more times you'll cave in before you'll stand up, but it's coming, it's coming, your spirit man is going to stand up strong, and you're going to be delivered in Jesus' name, Jesus' name, Jesus' name, Jesus' name. God, I rebuke anybody out of his life that calls himself a friend but that's not really a friend. I rebuke every influence that comes in the disguise of, oh, I'm there for you, buddy. I'm there to lift you up. I'm there to help you. But when the funds are low, they disappear. When the party is not there, they disappear. When the drugs, when the drinking is not there, they disappear. I rebuke those kind of people out of your life right now in Jesus' name. Jesus. Jesus' name. Oh. Jesus. David smoke the line like I'm smoking his line. I know his spirit and his heart, and I know I'm not embarrassing him. But I'm calling this out because I'm smoking your, I'm smoking your line. I'm okay doing this, right? All right. God, we bind together right now, and we build a hedge around this young man right now. Lord, I pray right now. There are so many forces of evil working against his salvation, working against his walk with you, working against his dreams, and I rebuke every one of them in the name of Jesus Christ. It's like I see a ring of witches. There, there's a spirit of witchcraft in your life, and it's not you that's playing with it, but there's somebody that you know that's dabbling in it. And they may have even approached you with it, tried to get you to devil, but there's somebody that the Lord right now wants me to heavily rebuke. I rebuke that power that they tried to show off in his life. It's not real power. It's temporary. And I rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody's tried to curse you, got mad at you, and cursed you. And I rebuke that curse right now in the name of Jesus Christ. You are not going to be healed under that threat. In Jesus' name, I loosen you from it right now. And I see a ring of witches just falling right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. The rubble show back up in his life. That those that are worshiping Satan, those wicked people, amen, those wicked people, amen, would be scared to show back up again. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Let me tell everyone here, you're not going to smite the devil without a response. The lion rose up against him. And I love this 
part. David caught him by the beard. And killed him. Raising your hands, that's awesome. 